We are back with you live once again on another Johnny Torch live broadcast. Broadcast number 212 today, Torch News Roundup number 258. On a snowy, make that blizzard afternoon here in New England. This is the way we like it. We like a nice cold winter, like 19 degrees outside with the snow blowing and the wind at 15 mile per hour gusts. This is why we live here. Certainly no other reason. <laughs> if you like a cold winter, this is the place to be. We're starting a little earlier because I realized I can't go for a walk in this weather. Usually my traditional Saturday afternoon broadcasts begin after I have a an afternoon constitutional and then come up and, you know, chill for a few minutes and then we do the broadcast. But no, I did get about 20 minutes worth of exercise trying to walk through that <laughs> foot snow mile there's miles of uh one foot of snow and uh trudging up and down that was uh was something to say the least welcome how have you been i don't know if it's snowing in your neck of the woods but there's no other place to be than here on a saturday afternoon the only way to spend your saturday here with us on the, the johnny torch live program and we've got a pretty interesting show for you hopefully to uh, keep you occupied while you're uh, waiting for Jack Frost to cool it with the snow escapades that he's uh, performing out there. All right, so before we get into the business at hand, the Torch News Roundup, let me, as usual, uh, welcome you to the show. I'm your host, Johnny Torch. If you don't know anything about the show, it's your first time. We're getting a lot of new subscribers, so I like to do this every couple of weeks. We uh, take a look at all things pop culture, typically comic book movie projects, TV projects. That's sort of my uh, my niche, if you will. And uh, we'll talk about sci-fi, Star Wars, Star Trek, the kind of stuff if it's in the news. Uh, nothing good, really, in the news about sci-fi, so I try not to get people's hopes up that I'm going to talk about that too often. But um, we've got an interesting show for you this week. And uh, we did another video not too long ago. Uh, I think it was Wednesday. I'm going to try to do some more of these short videos. We did a um, comics corner review, classic comics corner review of uh, Avengers Marvel Masterworks. So you might want to check that out, volume five. And uh, my comic book reviews typically do very well. That's why I don't know why I don't do more of them. But the thing is, I don't really have time to sit and read, you know, quickly. Like, for instance, this, this Marvel Masterwork that I reviewed, i had been reading it for basically six months, a little bit of time just to, uh, to to get it going. But, you know, again, with the work on the book, it's difficult to find time to really just spend, you know, an afternoon reading. I try to spend all my waking moments working on the book, which, by the way, the coloring is complete. And um, I might want to give it one more quick pass with the spell checking, but the spell checking is officially complete. So there's no misspelled words. Um, the, the tough thing is, is you can't trust the spell checker, at least the one I use to give you things in context. Like for instance, um, I forgot the letter W on the word now, and it said no, and it didn't alert me that it was, you know, grammatically incorrect that sentence. So I kind of have to go over these things again and read them and just make sure. Um, I still got to type up the coming attractions page because I don't know what happened to it. It. I lost the file. Heaven knows. I lose more files, more than most people, I suppose. And, um, of course, the um, uh, uh, previously on Bullets Bourbon, I guess as you can call it, that page. So I got a couple of pages still to do, but they're mostly typeset pages where I just got to type out some stuff. Shouldn't take me too long to get in the swing of things. And then I am done with issue nine, and it will be available as soon as the files are set and the printing is taken care of and uh check out the link in the description below for our website the adventures of bullets bourbon private eye where you can check out the all ages action adventure extraordinaire spectacular that is the adventures of bullets bourbon private eye where a down on his luck private eye takes on the most colorful collection of villains imaginable in each and every action-packed issue the one we're working on now is the family jewels arc Carrot Top, the arch nemesis of Bullets Bourbon, goes back to his father, Parsnip Top, who is the dawn of a powerful 
crime family in Stark City. They are about to go to war with the other dominant crime family, which is the Fruit Salad Mob. And uh, so it's the Vegetable Garden Gang versus the Fruit Salad Mob. These are the first two crime families we've seen in Bullets Bourbon. There are others. And I know of at least one more that's going to be making an appearance before too long. Uh, I'm going to keep that hush-hush for now. But, um, you know, there's got to be five families. There's always got to be five. So I'm, I've got... I've got two more in the works, so I've got to figure out what the fifth one is going to be. And you'll um, you'll see them all in time, I imagine. But it's it's uh, a little tougher coming up with uh, compelling families for this kind of universe. But um, we've got the the introduction of Veronica in this uh, in this uh, arc, who is Caratops Femme Fatale, who he tries to uh, set upon Bullets Bourbon to sort of uh, seduce him to the dark side. Does Veronica have her own plans? You'll have to find out when you read the arc. Family Jewels, Temptation Eyes, and the soon-to-be-released the uh, soon to be released in the final hours. So check them out in the link in the description. Probably. And um, make sure you hit like, share, and subscribe and do all those wonderful things because you are such wonderful, wonderful people. All right, we will move on now. I'll try not to make it a 20-minute <laughs> escapade. I'm thinking of doing a, a show, though, where I'm just going to talk about every issue. And I, I kind of don't want to do that because it's like it gives out the spoilers if you talk too much in detail about them. But the issues that are already out, um, the chronicles one two and three the trades of the first six issues they've been out for a while now and i kind of feel like maybe i could talk more freely about them it's a tough line to walk because on the one hand you want to be able to give the audience enough to get them interested but you don't want to give them so much that they're like well i you know like always happens with trailers a lot of people are like they've showed the last scene i feel like i've already seen the movie why do i really even need to see this now and i really like to see a lot of surprises thrown at people when I'm doing the stories. And that's why I've released very little considering what I did for the two previous issues of this book I'm working on in the final hours. So, you know, uh, hopefully it'll be uh, the right balance that I can find that right balance. All right, next we will get to Torch News Roundup number 258. News that just broke today in the comic book superhero world, Grant Gustin has agreed to a contract to return to The Flash for Season 9. Season 9. Now, this is... Um, we're in the middle of Season 8. I'm pretty sure we are in um, hiatus. I don't think the season wrapped up, did it? I'm pretty sure it didn't, because... I don't remember no real resolution to what was going on there. I mean, they they did the Armageddon thing, and they kind of did the aftermath of that, but it's funny, it hasn't been on for a while. Uh, let's see. TV Line has learned that the Flash star Grant Gustin has signed a new one-year deal to return as the titular Scarlet Speedster for a ninth season of CW's flagship superhero series, The Flash. Now, I don't know if this is really, you know... Uh, something unheard of because I think he had a one year deal last season to do season eight. Um, the, the story really isn't how much they paid him to return. So I think this suggests that the flash is on the downward trajectory. The show is probably going to be wrapping up pretty soon. I don't see it wrapping up any sooner than the 10th season. I think what they're probably doing here is another season proper. And then they're going to probably try to, set up the final season, the farewell season. I personally said it on Twitter. I would like to see the flash break Smallville's record <laughs> because I, if you don't know me, I think Smallville is the most overrated show that ever came out of CW. It was just, it's Superman without Superman. It's a Superman show without Superman. And I, I always felt like it insulted my intelligence I didn't watch it from the beginning. I, I seen what it was about in the first few episodes, and I was like, nah, this isn't for me. Then they 
flash forward to the uh, last two or three seasons where they kind of made it clear that they wanted desperately to do a superhero, a uh, Superman show. And, and so basically what they had to do was fall back on doing a superhero show without Superman, which means they brought in Green Arrow and they did a lot of proto Justice League characters and a lot of stuff that kind of, uh, well, not Green Arrow so much, but a lot of the uh, things they tried to do, I felt made a mockery of Superman and the genre. So it's kind of a, uh, a personal grudge I hold against that show. Uh, what can I say? A lot of people grew up with that, especially. I knew better. <laughs> and I like Grant Gustin. I think if you watch my video, I should try to find and link it. It was a good video. I enjoyed doing it. My top, I believe, 20 favorite acting performances, you know, my favorite actors to play these characters. Grant Gustin was in there. I think he broke the top 10. I think he was like 10. And I would love to see him go on with the show as long as possible, to be totally honest, because it's certainly the least woke of the shows. They don't seem to wave the banner every time they open the door and say, well, this is for the LGBTQ. This is for Black uh, Black Lives Matter. This is for, um, you know, such and such representation. Basically, the problem with The Flash and the reason why it's gotten the ire of a lot of uh former watchers is because it quickly became the iris show and apparently candace has a lot of stands i guess on twitter and they both try to placate them and i guess they also try to placate candace by giving her like these huge subplots and screen time and when honestly she's not very interesting as a character and you know, I think, honestly, if we're to talk honestly, I think in recent seasons, uh, or certainly the the past season, I think they tried to dial her back a little bit. This past season, season eight, I think, was a step in the right direction. But, again, it's it, your mileage may vary. It depends uh, how much you can tolerate of uh, a CW show. Personally, I think this The Flash was probably the best of the crop. I know now we have the... Um, star girl and superman and lois shows that kind of defy the cw format to different extents i think star girl because it started on hbo max really has a chance to kind of break that mold that pattern uh superman and lois is still kind of within the dawson's creek family drama type thing that cw is known for you know with the young cast and the teen angst and all that stuff uh let me finish uh the copy here let's see the network cw has yet to issue an official renewal for season nine coming to terms with grant is almost certainly only a precursor to a more formal announcement in the not so distant future it's also believed that the next season could be the show's swan song as as this is the interesting part as gustin declined a multi-year offer for the more favorable one-year deal. Now, again, like I said, I think he's done this before, but this kind of feels like a quarterback who knows he's only got a couple more seasons left in him, and he's like, well, show me what you got next season. You know, do we have a good team? Maybe I'll do it. He's probably going to try to assess where the show is going, and if it's, like, continually declining, he's going to jump ship. It should be noted that any final season talk is just speculation and perhaps premature as neither Gustin nor the CW has commented. Again, I don't think they're going to stop at 9. They're going to stop at 10. 9 would, you know, they outlasted Arrow. It would make them the longest-running Arrowverse show. They outlasted Supergirl, which, uh, what was it, six seasons for Supergirl? Eight seasons for Arrow. A lot of speculation that... Um, uh, Batwoman is going to end possibly after this season. That's that, you know, I don't think anybody's going to cry for that. But then they have a uh, Superman and Lois probably has a good future. So does Stargirl. They're not lacking for shows. Legends of Tomorrow is always allegedly on the chopping block, but they seem to be escaping the axe. You know, CW, the shows last as long as the creators want them to. Um, if the cast, somebody important in the cast wants out, they'll probably 
either find a way around it or they'll cancel it. But apart from that, these shows are going to last until the, the cast don't want to be around anymore. As per his new deal, which comes just ahead of the team wrapping season eight, Gustin is signed on to appear in 15 episodes next season. So it seems like we'll be getting a shortened season nine. He'll also be receiving a well-deserved raise as he's now expected to earn over $200,000 per episode. That's some, you know, that ain't cheap. With season nine all but confirmed, The Flash will now become the longest running hour of our show suppressing Arrow. And if it is indeed the final season, we'll settle in as the second longest running TV series behind Smallville. So let's take a look at this first. A 15 episode season. Now, I hear a lot of people squawking about that, that perhaps that's better. All killer, no filler, you know, do a short season, 12, 13 episodes like they do on streaming services or even shorter as they do on like Disney Plus. Give us a good season and fans will come back. I never really agreed with that because the format is the problem, not the episode order. Now, you're always going to get in any show that lasts like 20 episodes a season. You're going to get three or four filler episodes. It's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. I don't have a problem with that. I think that if you want to look at it that way in those terms, what you could do is you can make two short seasons, though. You make a 12-episode season, and they've become better at this. I, I think The Flash in particular, when they do their mid-season hiatus, they usually have had one significant storyline wrapped up and then they sort of are launch launching into a larger storyline that is going to take up the next season or the next half of the season. So you can look at it as two separate seasons. That's kind of the way I look at it within the one season. So, uh, you know, that's why I don't think you really need to shorten the season. Now, what people don't understand about this though, is perhaps if it's 15 episodes, that could mean that only 15 episodes have Grant Gustin. It could very easily be that they're planning to use the other, whatever it would be, five, seven, five to eight episodes maybe, to do a backdoor pilot. Because you know the CW likes to do that. And I wouldn't put it past them because... They wanted desperately to do uh, Green Arrow and the Canaries. They wanted desperately to do Painkiller. They put a lot of effort into trying to get, you know, some support for those spinoffs. It didn't happen, but I can see them trying to do that here. Now, what characters would they spin off? I think they would probably like to spin off um, the Wonder Twins there, whatever their names are, you know, Bart and Nora. They probably would like to do that. I think they would like to do like a future CW uh, Arrowverse, where you could have, you know, Green Arrow and the Canaries with Mia, and you could have the Barton Nora show, and quite possibly something else that they could spin off. You know, like perhaps in, in say, uh, the vein of Legends of Tomorrow. I, I don't think that would work any better than the previous shows they tried to spin off. So that's kind of, uh, I, I think, unlikely. That leaves us, what, whoever's on the show? I mean, Carlos is pretty much done. I mean, I think they, they can get him back like twice a season for a wave and hello, but that's out. I think they probably can depend on Danielle Panabaker to stay with the show, but I, I don't know if they're going to spin her off to a Killer Frost show. I don't really think that's what they're going to do. So, again, that that leaves the door pretty... I mean, I don't think they, any of the other... Uh, sidekicks there uh, chester and allegra are gonna uh, headline a show so that's probably it i think it might be just a shortened season but you know they could always work around grant they could have him sort of in shades of what they did with supergirl have her off on a different dimension and so they basically could have him being trapped somewhere and not get back to him for three or four episodes Again, I don't think that's what anybody wants, so hopefully that's not what they do. <laughs> but again, Grant Gustin, $200,000. I mean, he's worth it. He's really that whole show, and he's only gotten better. As I said, I think he really grew into the show by the fifth season. I think before that, it just kind of felt like 
you know, I think he's become a more settled in Flash at this point. I think he 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 actually feels like Barry Allen to me, even though this is sort of like a you know a bizarre CW verse version of him. He does feel more like Barry Allen to me now than he did at the start, to me anyway. All right, so let me know what you think. Leave your comments below about season nine of the Flash. Let me know what do you think about this potentially shortened season. What do you think about how far should the flash go? How many seasons do you want to see of the show? Do you still watch it at all? A lot of people have claimed to jump ship. Let me know what you think in the comments below me. I feel like I deserve a participation trophy for actually staying with all the CW Arrowverse shows. As long as I have the only one I'm not watching is Naomi, which I think, has just come out with its first episode this week. I probably could just check it out just to see what it's about, but I don't know that character from the comics. I really have no interest in trying to jump into another CW Arrowverse show, unless it's like a heavy hitter. If they bring out, you know, Batman and, and try to spin him off from Batwoman, like they did with Superman with Supergirl, I'm in. Uh, if they do a green lantern show, of course I'm in. They're going to do stuff like Naomi. I mean, I, I'm starting to, you know, there's only so many hours in a day. And, uh, you know, I got to start being a little more judicious with the uh, time spent. I know a lot of people feel that way about the shows that already exist. But to one extent or another, I, I still get a kick out of them. I enjoy them to an extent. Um, as I've always said, you know, this is not Shakespeare. I don't see myself going back to these and watching them uh, probably like maybe 20 years from now. God willing, I'm still alive. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll pick up a DVD set and say I want to relive a few episodes of The Flash. Apart from that, though, I mean, it seems the CW stuff seems to be disposable entertainment. That's what I always felt. And I'm disappointed because it could have been more than that. I've always said the first couple seasons of Arrow, first couple seasons of The Flash, uh, first season of Supergirl, maybe first two seasons of Legends, uh, shaky though they may have been, were decent. They were they were fun, and it kind of just spun out into kind of a out of control. It, it just uh, needed a firmer hand, I think, to to guide it. And um, unfortunately, that was not to be the case. But whatever you think of them, let me know in the comments below. I I still get out of I still get a kick out of Grant Gustin's Flash, and. Uh, I hope that uh, they give him uh, enough time for a fitting exit from the show. All right. Moving on now. Let's take a look at this other story that broke uh, the other day. This is an update on Guardians of the Galaxy Part 3. James Gunn has previously suggested that fans should expect to bid farewell to at least one member of the team in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. You know, the, the original thought when he said that was that they're probably going to kill somebody off. You know, James Gunn is not precious with these characters, I don't think. And depending on the actor that wants to leave the most, the MCU would probably allow it. It sounds like a heartbreaking death or two might be only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the major status quo shift we should prepare ourselves for. While speaking to Deadline from the set of the Marvel Studios threequel, Gunn confirmed that this is the end for us, the last time people will see this team of Guardians. So apparently this team, the Guardians of the Galaxy, will continue on, but probably with different members. Now, I know in the comics, you know, Teams in the comics always shift the roster. I don't know necessarily how many different characters have been in Guardians of the Galaxy. From what I know, it's mostly been these characters. So I really don't know what to expect. Gunn went on to say, it's big. It's so, so big and dark and different from what people might be expecting it to be. I just want to be true to the characters, the story, and give people the wrap up that they deserve for the story. That's always a little bit scary. I'm doing my best. Uh, of course, just because this original incarnation of the Guardians will be no more after Volume 3, 
doesn't mean some of the characters won't stick around in the MCU and possibly even form a new version of the team down the line. Specific story details are still a closely guarded secret, but a few nuggets have been revealed over the past year or so. We do know that Gamora will be a big part of the movie. If I remember correctly, she still doesn't remember who everybody is in the past and everything. And a recent report indicated that her relationship with Nebula is going to be the main focus. Of course, this Gamora is a variant of the original who doesn't know any of her teammates. We can probably expect a very different dynamic. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is set to hit theaters on May 23rd, 23, uh, 2023. So May 23rd, 2023. That uh, sounds like a lucky date. Um, I don't know. I, as you may be well aware, I'm not a huge Guardians fan. I know the first movie really blew people away and they were just like, oh, and the second movie kind of has its detractors and fans. But um, I thought the first movie was fun and, and cool. The second movie was a little darker, not quite what I was hoping for, but it had some good moments. I mean, I enjoyed uh, the uh, ending with Yanu, Yandu was... Uh, very moving. So, I mean, I imagine something like that is going to happen here. And of course, uh, Chris Pratt and um, Bradley Cooper, they're a lot of fun, especially seeing them get into these little bickering spats. Uh, you know, Drax, of course, adding to his, uh, adding to the roster there with his uh, form of comedy. I don't know. It should be interesting. I mean, uh, Gamora is not technically a member of the crew now, I guess, but I, I suppose she'll be a member of the crew before it's all over. But then again, there'll be no crew when it's all over. So who knows? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you looking forward to Guardians 3? And I think also they mentioned, it's not in this, uh, not in the copy here, but apparently, you know, he's going he's gonna to have a whole new mixtape to listen to. Uh, that's always one of the fun parts of the, of the Guardians films is seeing what they're listening to. Uh, all right, so next up, again, this is not uh, <clears throat> not exactly terribly exciting news, but I thought I'd comment on it because I'm always looking forward to a good Masters of the Universe project. We've gotten a few so far, nothing good. Now, I had Netflix. Actually, I still have Netflix for like about two more days. <laughs> I didn't watch He-Man Revelations. I probably could have. I probably should have just to make up my own mind on it. But I don't know. It, it's a darker take. People are getting killed. Orko is getting killed. I, I, at this point, I don't need to watch something to make up my own mind. If it stinks, if it doesn't sound that great, I'm, I'm not going to waste my time. As I said earlier, you got to be a little more judicious on what we watch. And, you know, I don't think I'm not one of those types that act like, well, if you watched it, you've endorsed it. You've given them your blessing. Well, it's part of the package deal the, the of Netflix. If I wanted to watch it, I already paid for Netflix to watch uh, Cobra Kai. I wouldn't feel anything bad about watching it. But again, that's hours out of my day that I'm going to waste if they are doing a complete reversal of what I want to see in a He-Man movie now, or a miniseries in that case. In this case now, we're on, this is probably the 117th version of, of the Masters of the Universe movie that they've been trying to get another one off the ground since 1987 when one Dolph Lundgren first spoke the words, I have the power! And um, they still haven't been able to get it right. I mean, personally, I love, you know, Dolph Seaman. It, it's a period piece. It was something that was when I was a kid and grew up with. So, Obviously, I still love that movie, but we haven't been able to get anything decent off the ground since. Last, we heard Sony Pictures and Mattel Films had scrapped plans for their live-action Masters of the Universe movie. But the project has now found a new lease of life. Should be a new lease on life. Uh, I'm going to take issue with this copy. On Netflix with a new actor in the lead. Now, apparently, Netflix has got all the, all the rights to doing He-Man stuff now, apparently. They did that crappy She-Ra show. They did that, again, I, I can't say from any firsthand uh, knowledge what that crappy 
Kevin Smith version of He-Man. So now they're going to try to do a live action crappy version of He-Man. Uh, the Hollywood Reporter reports that West Side Story actor Kyle Allen is set to play He-Man, replacing the previously cast Noah Sorrento, uh, soon to be seen in Black Adam, who parted ways with the film last year. The movie's reportedly set to begin production this summer, with Knee Brothers of The Lost City directing from a screenplay they co-wrote with Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Ring scribe David Callum. Todd Black, Jason Blumenthal, and Steve Titch will produce, along with Devin Franklin, Robbie Brenner, and Kevin McKeon, will oversee the project for Mattel Films. How bad is this going to be, you, you may ask? Well, let's take a look. The story will focus on an orphan named Adam who discovers he is a prince destined to be the savior of a faraway land and must quickly learn of his power in order to save his home from the evil Skeletor. Yeah. Um, first of all, Adam was never an orphan. He was always brought up as a prince. So right off the bat, they're changing the story again. I don't know. I don't know what they have against doing an out and out He Man version straight from the cartoon, straight from the original cartoon. I mean, of course, you you toughen it up a little bit. You don't have to have a lot of focus on Orko and the baby dragons and the cringer being afraid to get a drink of water. But you focus on the other parts that were ingrained in us as kids that we love these characters i mean to see trap jaw in in live action and triclops and you know these are characters that would just be you know they'd blow people away you ever seen that in a movie on a tra in a trailer i'd want to go see that right away not even know what it's about and they have such a rich history to draw on that they could easily make this a, a trilogy of movies I still say, you're looking for the next Lord of the Rings. Look at He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. All you have to do is distill down and find somebody that knows these characters, that appreciates these characters. Distill down the ideas, the, the quintessential relationships between these characters. you got so much to work with. You'd have a trilogy that'd be worth over a billion dollars a movie. But unfortunately, they keep just hemming and hawing and... Finally, they will make a project someday that will just be entirely forgettable. That's what I'm afraid. The beverage of choice today, in case you're interested, Concord Grape and Hibiscus Apple Cider Vinegar. Not bad, I must say. All right, so again, let me know what you think about this... Uh, potential masters of the universe uh, movie i guess it's a movie right it's just going to be one and i don't know it doesn't really it doesn't inspire me with much uh enthusiasm the shang chi writer is going to be doing it well that about does it for that let me know what you think in the comments below about masters of the universe the upcoming supposedly the upcoming major motion picture all right uh major on netflix next up this was a story that uh, got some headlines over the past week peter dinklage taking issue with disney's reimagined snow white and the seven dwarfs now need i need i really have to explain how ridiculous this is <clears throat> now as you know snow white is being played by a Latina. So basically, she's not Snow White already. So we've already got problems with this movie. So I'm not saying that his comments or his involvement here is necessarily going to spoil a good thing. Let's get that straight right off the bat. This is going to be crap to begin with. It was crap already, and now he's crapping on it even more. But for the wrong reason. Now, uh, as I said, Tinklage 52, uh, let's see, says, despite Disney's progressive idea to catch, to cast Rachel 
Ziggler as Snow White, the remake still tells a quote-unquote backward story. Literally no offense to anyone, but I was a little taken aback, he said. They were very proud to cast a Latina actress as Snow White, but you're still telling the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Take a step back and look at what you're doing there, you know? It makes no sense to me. You are progressing in one way, but you're still making that backward story of seven dwarfs living in a cave. Have I done nothing to advance the cause from my soapbox? I guess I'm not loud enough. You know, he's just being a little... I ain't gonna say the word. First off, this is kind of... This is the, like, highfalutin, you know, moral superiority he's trying to put on display here about, you know... I, He's literally saying that you can't use dwarfs in a movie if they're going to be funny. Because that was kind of the point of the seven dwarfs in that picture was in the original picture, the 1937 motion picture, was that they were all funny. They were all cute. They all had their own idiosyncrasies. And we can't do that anymore these days because people might point at the little person and laugh and say, <laughs> dopey, he's funny. He's funny looking, you know. So basically what he's doing is gatekeeping what dwarves can do in movies. And he's basically telling a bunch of Hollywood actors who are dwarves, you're not doing this. I said you're not doing this or you're not doing it. Who the heck is he? Who the heck died and made him boss? You know, what is he, king of the dwarves or something? I mean, this should be up to the dwarves that want to take this role or these roles. The thing is, you're trying to say that you can never have like a funny dwarf character again. I think that's basically what he's trying to get to. It's sort of the same thing as like, you can never have, you know, I don't know, but like these sort of uh, insensitive portrayals of like, you know, black slaves or, or, or black uh, servants, I should say. It's kind of like, uh, reminds me of Hattie McDaniel saying, you know, I could play a black maiden and make $20,000 a, a picture, or I could be an actual maid and get like $20 a week. You know what I mean? It's the same thing here. I mean, it's easy for him to be up in his ivory tower and say, well, dwarves should have better roles to pick and choose from. Well, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is a beloved tale. It's a classic tale. I don't think where he where does he get off like telling dwarves what they should or shouldn't do? They're supposed to be shamed for playing dwarves, uh, the, the the seven dwarves. That's pretty low. That's pretty low. You've just ruined the chances of probably seven little people, probably seven men. Although knowing Disney, they'll probably change it into like three transgender and one you know female and the two whatever. But the fact is, he's taking away these roles from these little actors, little people actors. All right, Disney responded Tuesday to Peter Dinklage's comments about the remake, uh, assuring him that the new movie won't be as incendiary as imagined. Instead of dwarfs, Disney will fill the void with a group of what they describe as magical creatures, according to casting sheets that the rap has seen. They are currently looking for voice actors to give these creatures personality. Uh, so again, now instead of having dwarves, you're going to have voice actors. Voice actors are going to get the jobs that dwarves should have had. And quite frankly, I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to hire dwarves to do the voices of magical creatures. At that point, why don't you just make them the dwarves? So you basically, they're not going to do that. You're basically getting dwarves kicked out of Hollywood. How many chances do they get to make a big major motion picture? I mean, you're a dwarf. Your you're, uh, prospects in Hollywood, unfortunately, are not that great. Now, he might be trying to be some, uh, as they all are, some, some, you know, all the leftists are trying to uh, preserve the integrity of, you know, dwarves in Hollywood. But the fact remains, as I said, you have a high-profile movie here. And, of course, I'm sure the dwarves... Even in the original picture, they were treated with respect. I mean, like I said, they were comedy characters. But the reason why they were comedy characters were look at the rest of the picture. You've got a orphan girl who's almost killed by a huntsman 
because of a wicked stepmother's jealousy. And then she runs into the forest alone by herself in the dark and fear and this and that. And she gets befriended or maybe I'd go so far as to say adopted by the seven dwarfs who, you know, take her in and give her a place to live. I mean, there could not be a more no noble portrayal of human beings, dwarves or otherwise, than the seven dwarfs. And like I said, if the whole problem that he has with this is that they're to be laughed at and they have funny names, happy and dopey and uh, sleepy and sneezy and doc and grumpy and bashful. You know, this is, this is just like classic overstepping his bounds. Uh, you know, he really ought to keep his mouth shut. He really has no business telling anybody dwarves or otherwise what roles they can take, what, characters should be in the picture this is a movie you know and a story that's gone back multiple generations i mean even before the disney movie the story existed albeit somewhat more darker in its original incarnation but again it's it's known because disney made it a beloved fable that's what really is uh given it its claim to fame and now you know there have been many Snow White movies in recent years, right? There was one with Lily Collins. There was one with, um, what was it? Chris Hemsworth or was it Liam Hemsworth? I don't know. There was a couple of them. And I guess they shied away from putting dwarves in the movie because of something like this. And I imagine, you know, since Disney owns Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, the idea was to still capitalize on that image. But again, I'm not going to see this movie to begin with. This is just more trash that the Disney company keeps ejecting out. And uh, just, I, I just don't want to be too graphic. They did. All right. So um, again, also, you know, they're living in a cave and this and that. I mean, this is like supposedly taking place in like, I don't know if you want to say medieval times, something like that. And they got a noble occupation. They're they're digging uh, for gems in a mine, which, you know, probably make them very wealthy. Again, I don't understand what his problem is. But, again, Peter Dinklage, shut the heck up, mind your business, and let, you know, dwarves have whatever roles they want in Hollywood. Because heaven knows they don't got too many to choose from as it is. I don't think they've had any real uh, Hollywood success since like what return of the jedi and he's trying to take roles away from them come on uh i am curious all right next up our final story of the day of course this just keeps happening right this just keeps happening hollywood woke hollywood keeps telling strong women these intelligent actresses to shut the hell up and go sit down Basically, again, now that's what's happening here. We have all the nutty SJWs on the left coming out of the woodwork because Evangeline Lilly are, is supporting the uh, right to not uh, inject foreign substances into your body by mandate. That's, that's, I'll see if I can put that as... Uh, as gently and cryptically as possible as to avoid censorship in 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 uh america the, the bastion of free speech we still got to be careful what we say on these platforms all right in case you are unaware ant-man and the wasp quantumania star evangeline Lilly is facing backlash yet again for her social media post sharing her thoughts on the thing and the thing mandates in particular. Uh, let's see. She reveals that she attended the anti-thing rally in Washington over the weekend to speak out in support of medical sovereignty. She's quoted on Instagram saying, I believe nobody should ever be forced to inject their body with anything against their will. Under threat of violent attack, arrest or detention without trial, loss of employment, homelessness, starvation, loss of education, alienation from loved ones, excommunication from society, under any threat whatsoever. This is not the way. This is not safe. 
This is not healthy. This is not love. I understand the world is in fear, but I don't believe that answering fear with force will fix our problems. Uh, now, of course, this sent the SJWs into a tizzy, and everyone is... I think she's already finished filming Ant-Man and the Wasp 3, but, of course, everyone is calling for her to uh, resign from Marvel, recast the Wasp, the same thing they did with Letitia Wright two weeks ago when, you know, the same brouhaha was uh, leveled because uh, Letitia apparently has made comments that she doesn't want to do the thing. And apparently, Evangeline Lilly also continues on to say that she's pro-choice before the thing, and now she's still pro-choice, which, again, I, that disappoints me greatly because that's apparently... That pro-choice stance, obviously we know what that means, and I'm not going to get into it here, but it's a very sad and pathetic thing to be supporting. Back in 2020, Evangeline Lilly posted an Instagram photo captioning, captioned business as usual in response for calls to people to self-isolate when the thing first hit. She also said that she considered it to be a respiratory flu. She was then, I'll put this in, forced to apologize shortly after. Now, again, that's basically what it is. She said all along that she doesn't believe in this kind of ridiculousness that's happened in our society because of this panic that the left has basically unleashed on everyone. And, uh, you know, it's basically, it was basically just to get Trump out of office. I don't mind saying it. Now, I don't suppose that uh, Lily is a supporter of Trump nor anybody else in uh, uh, this particular case. Uh, I mean, I don't know Letitia Wright's position she, since she's from England, I suppose. But many of us could see very early on what was going on here. Mail-in votes and just blowing this whole thing out of proportion for one reason alone. And... Hollywood, being as woke as it is, is not going to allow her to just come out and say that. That's why they had to back her up and say, wait a minute, don't be saying anything that we have to take blowback from until after you're through with your contract. And they were already suggesting, there were already reports suggesting that Evangeline Lilly is probably done playing the Wasp. Um, they said something in, in some interview where she said, well, we're going to try to make this one the best yet. It's, you know, it's it's probably our, our swan song or something to that effect, which leads me to believe that she's seen the writing on the wall, that if she doesn't want to play the game where all this is going on and you're supposed to say, self-isolate, stay indoors, wear 50,000 uh, facial garb things on your face to stay safe, stay six feet away from people. And if you're going to call that for the bunkum that it is, Hollywood can't be associated with you because the left is running the Hollywood and the left is running this whole scam. So basically she was told to sit down and shut up until your term is over. Apparently now that the movie is just about done, she's kind of feeling brave enough to talk about this again in public and bravo to her. I hats off to her. I think she should. And I think more, you know, people of all stripes should have a very vocal say in what's going on to us. It's obviously, it's obviously very wrong. I think at least as of this broadcast, a lot of people are uh, getting their freedoms back in places like England and so forth. But then there are places like Australia where it's still under a brutal tyranny. Uh, we in America here for, for our sake, I, I'll say that we're so, somewhere in the middle depending on what state you're in, what city you're in, in some cases, you could be under a lot of tyranny or you could be leading a normal life like we should be leading. leading. But again, this is, uh, they basically are telling Letitia Wright and Evangeline Lilly, sit down, shut up, don't speak your mind, because you've seen what happened to Gina Carano. That could very easily be you. And the more vocal you are, the more outspoken you are as Gina Carano was not afraid of saying these things and making these points, that's how farther down the line you're going to put yourself once you, you know, 
evoke the wrath of the SJWs. And uh, I, I don't suppose they want to face that, but thankfully they're outspoken enough to say something about it. And again, this is the pure hypocrisy of woke Hollywood. We need more prominent roles for women, and we need uh, to get rid of the male gaze, and we need to have women taken seriously. Same thing as we were just talking about with Peter Dinklage and dwarves. But then again, you're going to gatekeep, and you're going to tell them what they can say, what they can do, what they can think who they can vote for. And it's just pure hypocrisy. It's just the height of hypocrisy to try to act like they're these master feminists that just don't have any care or consideration for the freedom of speech these women have as a right. And I think that's disgusting, very disappointing, and quite aggravating to have to see them continually being uh, spoken against. Now, Thankfully, it doesn't look like this is going to affect Evangeline Lilly. I mean, the, the, the usual suspects have uh, all, you know, blown their top. But I imagine at some point, you know, either this is going to blow over and she'll be able to continue on with her career. Or at the very least, she managed to probably finish out her term as the Wasp without having any, you know fear of being recast or whatever or reduced role in the uh future of the mcu i honestly think they should build they really should build the mcu around ant-man and the wasp because when you look at them the original hank and janet versions were like basically mainstays in the avengers the longest tenured i think they started in the 60s and they didn't go anywhere until like the 80s and then, um, you know, Hank ends up having his problems and his breakdowns or whatever. And he kind of was off the team. And then the Wasp didn't really leave effectively until a little after that. So they really could build the Avengers around them, but they don't really want to. I think they seem to be just keeping them around as like comic relief. They do these funny little movies every couple of years. And they're not really getting the big focus in the Avengers films. Maybe that could be different going forward. I hope it is. Um, Civil War, I think, got a pretty decent spotlight, but they should be spotlighting Ant-Man and the Wasp more than they are. And if this is really their last film as a trilogy, they definitely should get a bigger part in the Avengers films, or perhaps maybe a, maybe a Marvel TV show on uh, Disney+. Plus. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And that about wraps it up yet again for another stelling, stellar broadcast of the Torch News Roundup, Johnny Torch Live, the only way to spend your Saturday here with us. And as often as possible, we'll try to make it a date on every Saturday and uh, give you the news of the week that's all fit for your divine ears. And uh, so we'll try to do a couple more videos during the week. I don't know uh, exactly what I'm going to get to, but we'll try to get to them. Uh, maybe another uh, comic review. I've got the Adventures of Batman uh, from uh, Paul Dini um, that I'm looking forward to uh, doing a review on. So maybe we'll do that. A couple other things in the pipeline that I will not talk about yet, but we will see what we will see. And so until next we meet, this is Johnny Torch reminding you once again, Keep the flame burning brightly, and I'll be with you again real soon.